Good morning. It's good to be with you again, and uh, welcome inside from the inclement weather <laughs> we're having at the moment. Anyway, it's good to be with you, and uh, we're going to begin by singing a well-known hymn. The words are on the screen, as usual. Uh, if, you, if you are following in the hymn book, it's number 51. Uh, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Thank you, O God, that even though we celebrate you as a God of holiness, a God who is pure, a God who is perfect in every way, yet we who are imperfect, not always holy, can, in, can come freely into your presence. And we can do that because you first came to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. To walk this earth, to experience all the things we experience, except sin itself. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us through your life, through your death on the cross, and your glorious resurrection. We thank you that in you alone we can find true forgiveness for all our unholiness and our wrongdoing. Thank you that we can find in you 
a new life, a new beginning, always a new beginning. We thank you that you are the God of the new. And as we sung in the closing lines of that hymn, Lord, we celebrate you as a God in three persons, blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you that through the gift of your Spirit, we may know the reality of the risen Jesus Christ living in us and through us day by day by day. And so we come to offer our worship, our prayers, and our adoration as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This day, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory amen amen we turn to our reading this morning before i um actually read it can I, I tell you the, the, the main theme I want to reflect upon this morning is the theme of um, secrecy secrecy and silence so you can listen out for that in the reading Mark chapter 1 beginning at verse 35 very early in the morning while it was still dark Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled through Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet, the people still came to him from everywhere. This is the word of the Lord, for which we give thanks to God. We're going to sing again, and uh, we sing as a prayer, number five in Baptist Praise and Worship, Be Still. For the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here.
Well, I'm sure uh, that you've all heard of the writer Oscar Wilde. Apparently, Oscar Wilde once said, I can resist anything except temptation. <laughs> I thought about that because I think maybe it's the same when it comes to keeping a secret. Please don't tell anyone. And however much you say it, somewhere along the line, you discover the news has leaked out. We're not very good at it. We read of leaks in the government uh, and all over the place we read of leaks. And it seems that keeping a secret is very hard for lots of people to do. And uh, when you're training to be a church minister, one of the things you have to learn very quickly is about how to handle issues of confidentiality. Anyway, in Mark's Gospel, um, that theme of secrecy um, comes through several times. When I was a, an undergraduate studying for ministry in the first year, the set text we had for the whole year was Mark's Gospel. Um, and there is a theme that runs through Mark, especially especially in Mark's Gospel, Jesus several times says to people, don't tell anyone, keep it a secret. And scholars could talk about the messianic secret, and that's by the by. But why? Well, it's generally thought that um, Jesus knew he had a ministry to perform, but his time when this will all come to fulfilment through his death on the cross, was not yet. And so on several occasions, as with this man healed from leprosy, he says, um, don't tell anyone. But he did tell him, go show yourself to the priest, the high priest. And that was actually the dumb thing. That was what you did in those days, particularly if you had leprosy. For all sorts of reasons you had to go and get a clean bill of health from the high priest before you'd be accepted in wider society and jesus said, then go and do that but don't tell anybody else what does the man do <laughs> he doesn't do that he goes off and starts telling everybody what's happened and as a result jesus we're told couldn't go into the towns and the villages and he had to go somewhere to a more lonely place he, di he didn't keep the secret he was not a good secret keeper so that's one aspect of secrecy that comes into this passage. But I particularly want to focus on the first part of the reading where we're told that it was early in the morning and Jesus, it was still dark, and Jesus got up and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Already in Mark's Gospel, news of Jesus' ministry has been spreading. His preaching is healing the sick and so on and crowds were gathering but Jesus needs time alone with his Father in prayer. In his full humanity, he needed time and space. And he depended for all he did on his Father. And I have to say, if Jesus needed that, how much more do we? And yet, how hard we often find it. To find the secret place, the quiet place, <coughs> just to be alone with God, we find it hard. Well, I'm confessing, confession, I find it hard. I find I get distracted. All sorts of things distract. I was... Reflecting on this a while ago, I actually ordered a book called Into the Silent Land, uh, which I'm still working my way through. It's quite a complicated little book, but it's by an author called Martin Laird. I think it's about 20 years old now, but Martin Laird is um, a monk, but he's also a part-time tutor in a university in the States on spirituality. And he talks about... Um, the importance sometimes of simply finding the secret place and finding time to be alone and silent before God. And do you know there are several chapters in this little book that talk about how difficult it is 
Um, here speaks a monk. How difficult it is because how many distractions bombard your mind? Things that come in from outside. Oh, I didn't do that. Or something else. Or suddenly a memory of something. And it's almost as though we're being bombarded with distractions all the time. It's an interesting book, and it's a very honest book, about the trouble and the difficulty we find in finding the secret place to be quiet and alone with God. And at various times in my life of ministry, I've, I've a, couple of, a couple of occasions I'll relate to you, I've sought to do this particularly when I felt that the demands were so heavy, I, I just wanted to, I needed to be away for a few days. And uh, it was only my second year in ministry, I think, I was in Sussex. And um, I booked a three night retreat at a local convent. They did accept men, I hasten to add. Um, and, uh, it was a silent community, no conversation, until the evening meal. And then you could talk, and everyone, off they went, you know. And from then on, it was fine. But all that from, from, from dawn through to the evening meal, you couldn't say a word. And do you know, the first day I was there, it was so hard. It was a real struggle. Because normally our, our life is filled, we're bombarded with messages and goodness knows what, I mean, radio and TV and goodness knows, but and suddenly there's nothing. And so you try to pray and then all oh, something, these distractions pop into your brain again, you know, something else pops in. Ah, oh, it was so, so hard. Got to day two, things were different. It took a whole day of being there to somehow become a little bit acclimatised. Day two, oh my gosh, there's something to this. You start to feel a depth going deeper into your own being, but also deeper into your relationship with God. It's like things start occurring. I don't know, it's just it's... Suddenly it's different. Day three, same thing. And then the day came for me to leave. And I certainly felt refreshed, I have to say that. And I went out, I got into the car, and immediately I got in the car, I went to switch the radio on. And then I stopped and thought, why? <laughs> You've spent the last few days in silence, why am I suddenly going back to this routine? And I didn't. But I mean, obviously, life takes over and blah, blah, blah. So that was my first experience, which is actually a very strong experience of silence, of being alone, spending time with God. But there was a second occasion, more recent, well, it was back in the 2007, I was in Cardiff. I was a pastor at Albany Road in Cardiff. And I had a sabbatical. And um, I'd booked eight weeks at the Baptists, International Baptist Seminary in Prague, as it was then, it's now in Amsterdam. And I'd been commissioned to write a theological paper, which is what I do sometimes. Um, I can't even remember what it was about. But I thought, before I go there, I'll, um, I want a week's retreat somewhere. So I went to the Northumbria community, some of you will be aware of that, in, in Northumbria, obviously. And again, it was an opportunity, it wasn't a silent retreat, but it was an opportunity to withdraw from the world, withdraw from normal life, and just spend some time. I encourage you to get involved, they, you know, I did some gardening for them while I was there. They probably wished I hadn't afterwards, but anyway. Um, and then, um, that weekend, I didn't come back immediately. My wife Susan uh, came up and joined me, and we we stayed on in the, on, around the Northumbrian coast for a long weekend. And one day we went to Lindisfarne. I don't know how many of you have been there, the Holy Isle. <clears throat> 
Well, that was extraordinary. Because again, just being there where there had been a Christian presence for so long, there was something about in the atmosphere, and I, I can't even begin to describe what it was, but there was something there. And I came away, and I went to Prague, and I didn't write the paper that I was supposed to write. I wrote a different theological paper. It was called, Can a Baptist Believe in Sacred Space? <laughs> Because my background was, you know, oh, we're Baptists, we don't do sort of sanctuaries. And, you know, to which I argued, yes, of course, of course, we must believe in sacred space. And I've tried to give some justification. Well, I won't go into all that. Um, but again, just two of my own experiences. I wonder if you've had uh, some of the two, a few people are nodding at me. I think you, you've had similar experiences, maybe in different places. But I suppose where really where I want to go and where I want to finish with this is. You know, Jesus sought out a secret place. Okay, he got disturbed pretty quickly by the disciples. They're all looking for you. But Jesus had to seek out the solitary place. I wonder if you have a secret place. I wonder how often we try to seek out the solitary place. What's interesting is disciples tracked him down Everyone's looking for you, they said. And Jesus said, well, let's go somewhere else then. <laughs> Moving on. And I think there's, there's a lesson there, oh, quickly. There's a lesson there too. That when we spend time with Jesus, with God, don't be surprised if suddenly there's a moving on to something else that God has, yeah, for whatever reason. God's leading whatever. So I'm just going to leave it with you, really, a reflection really on, on secrecy and finding the quiet place. And I just want to say that as we seek God, don't be surprised if the result is a little unsettling. Because God never leaves us unchanged. So let's pray together. And in the light of that, I thought I would suggest three or four areas for prayer and then leave a little bit of silence for you to pray as you feel led. All right, so let's pray. Lord God, as we come to you in the stillness, we lift before you places on our heart around this world where we see terrible conflict and suffering. We see it on the news, we read it in our papers, we offer our prayers to you for these places, Lord. Lord, we've read the story of a, a man healed from leprosy. We bring before you people known to us who are suffering sickness of various forms. Lord God, as we sit here today in this service, we especially pray for your church, your church worldwide, here in this city and here in our land.
Lord, finally, we pray for ourselves. We all have different needs. We bring those needs to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For we offer them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. For our final hymn, I've chosen, um, it's number 536 in, in Baptist Praise and Worship. Bearing in mind all that we've thought about this morning, I've chosen the hymn, Master Speak, Your Servant Heareth. So I wish you well in seeking to hear the voice of the Lord. Shall we close with the words of the grace together? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.